Okay, cool. So um, for those of you who missed it, <clears throat> hold on. Let me just share my screen real quick because this was important. This was really important to play this song. You can't hear it though, unless I crank it. Let me crank it. <clears throat> Only because this is recording by doing the dance. That's my little plug there. Welcome back, September. How's everybody's summer? Was it good? I don't see any dark faces. I don't see any suntans. Let me see here. Art Janot. I don't see it. You're, you're still white as a ghost there. Look at you. No color. No color. That's OK. We can't hear you, but you look good. Oh, there you get your light on now. Well, welcome back, everybody. Um, this morning, I anticipate um, kind of low participation. A lot of people are bringing their kids back to school. And um, so we'll record this call um, for everybody to listen to because there's just a ton of things to kind of go through and catch up on uh, since the, uh, the last time we chat at some point in July, I guess. No, maybe June. So June, <laughs> July. Time flies, right? Time flies. Um, so let's, I'll just kind of go through my bit of my agenda. Let's just see what I got here. Not that guy. That's, <laughs> guy. That's not my agenda. No, this is my agenda here. Here we go. Here we go. So here's like kind of a quick and dirty what we're, what we're going to go through this morning. Um, I will say, I was just chatting with mom. She just arrived in Newfoundland. Uh -huh. And um, and she's actually going, she was trying to pop, pop in, but she just has such bad connections. So she won't be able to jump in uh, this morning. But she was just going to do a little cameo and show you guys the ocean. She's there prepping, uh, uh, I guess, Newfoundland for us. Because we've got a big crew going out uh, next couple of weeks. So... Christina, how many people are we up to confirm from the office? Uh, I think we're at 56. Oh, okay. I thought it was higher than that. Well, there's there's guests. So if you add everyone, there's about 18 guests, but there's 56 oh. E21ers. Got it. Got it, got it, got it. Um, so that's going to be a big party. That'll be a big event. Uh, so anyways, let's go through the, a quick agenda. Obviously, everybody has probably heard by now, interest rates have gone up. I'm going to get uh, Rod to chat a little bit about that. Just some upcoming dates that everybody should be aware of. Some September the 18th to the 21st, we've got the Newfoundland Canada Conference with Century 21. Um, this is going to be really a two-day event. It's the Monday and the Tuesday, and then they do the wrap-up on the Wednesday. For those two days, there are going to be so many different workshops <clears throat> that we should all be taking advantage of. We are going to network, of course, and to um, have a great fun. But this is also uh, a great, uh, I guess, reset uh, for, for many people and, and different sessions you can pop into, um, whether it be social media, whether it be the technology with Century 21, whether it be da -da 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 -da. There's, there's going to be a lot there. It's going to be ram-packed. Of great sessions. Um, October 4th, if you can kind of tentatively put this in your calendars, actually not tentative, it's booked. Um, we're going to be doing like a fall recharge session uh, for the Brampton and the Orangeville office. <clears throat> and that'll be held at the uh, Turnberry Golf Course. Uh, so we'll, we'll just give you further details on that. But um, we've got uh, guest speaker Chris Leader who will be there as well. So we'll chat about that. Um, and then as well, Cassandra Walker is going to be doing FinTrack training, which is mandatory. We don't use that word very often in, in real estate, but uh, it is mandatory that uh, agents uh, are getting this training every two years. So um, this we're coming up on that. So she'll be doing it over Zoom and um, we'll have uh, Cassandra chat and go through that. Just a quick update. Um, many of you have seen that I, we put out, we've been interviewing for a manager in the Orangeville office. 
Um, that has been a wonderful experience, uh, interviewing people both locally in Orangeville, uh, but also within our company, um, some amazing aspiring uh, uh, professions that we have that want to advance their career. So we've, we've actually had a, a great turnout from it. Uh, lots of interviews, lots of meetings, and we'll be announcing the, uh, the new manager of the Orangeville office. And of course, Margaret's been doing a phenomenal job uh, in that office for the last uh, couple of years. And of course, Linda, before that, where we are today, we have absolutely, you know, Linda and Margaret to thank um, for where, where we've come from and where we are today. So, um, but as, uh, as time goes on, we need uh, uh, new people in those, in those roles and, um, and then allow uh, Margaret to kind of get back to her business up in Wasega as a superstar there. So, um, so we'll chat a little bit more about that. Uh, I posted on the, the group there kind of the goals, Buffini five categories of goals, a great time to, to set our goals. Tips for selling stale homes. Um, I know many of you are challenged with that, so we're going to chat about that. Just what we need to be doing from a marketing standpoint. We're going to go through market stats. We're going to talk about Schedule B, talk about deposit instructions, and then some challenges that I know. Um, it, I, I was even chatting a couple in the um, Orangeville office. I think it was Tony who was saying, hey, we got to we got to go through a couple of uh, items here, the reminders on, on, uh, on some new processes we don't typically see in, in the last five years, but reminders for everybody. So that's our quick agenda. Hey, Rod, why don't we just jump, we quickly jump into um, rates, rate hikes, what this means, and uh, kind of give us an overview of, of what you might anticipate in the future and, and why this is being done. And, and for those of you who don't know, uh, Rod, Rod is our, in, in Brampton, in Orangeville, he is our in-house mortgage uh, broker and um, is doing a really good job. Uh, I'm getting great feedback on, on him working with uh, agents within the office. But uh, Rod, why don't, you, why don't you let us know what happened today? Well, as expected, the Bank of Canada raised rates again. So the bank rate rose, which is going to affect the prime rate. Prime will now be 5.45%. Uh, so if you're in a variable rate mortgage or you have a line of credit, expect your payments to go up. Um, you know, there was a lot of chat uh, or chatter about this. This could be the last one this year. But now looking further into the notes that the Bank of Canada puts, that they said, given the outlook for inflation, the governing council still judges that the policy interest rate will need to rise further. So the reason they're doing this is they're trying to get inflation in check and inflation is still, you know, even though it came down to 7.6% in July from 8.1% in June, uh, they're still concerned about the broad inflation. You know, as, you, as anyone noticed, noticed uh, gas prices have come down, but there's other costs that are still up. And this is what they're trying to do by bringing the rates up. Um, number one. Number two, they were also trying to slow down the housing economy, unfortunately, uh, but how much further they're going to go remains to be seen. I was hoping this might be the last one, but reading this a little further, there's they're still leaving the door open for some further moves. Hopefully, not a lot more. We should be near the top, but uh, no one has a crystal ball, and we'll have to see what happens with inflation. Uh, inflation should be out in the middle of the month for. Uh, August, and then we'll see sort of the next steps from the bank. The bank next time they meet is October 26th. And I think the one after that's uh, early December, I think December 7th. So those are the only two other opportunities, but I, you know, hopefully we're near the top of this because we started at 0.25% for the bank rate. This is already uh, up by 3% since the, since March when they started tightening rates. But if anyone has questions or anything, always feel free to reach out. You can always email me or just give me a call. And I, I sent the email out. This is what Trevor's showing. So if you do have any questions, just let me know. Cool. Appreciate that, uh, Rod. I mean, so what's your prediction, Rod? Give us, give us uh, what's going to happen in the future. Well, based on inflation still being a big concern there might be a couple more moves hopefully smaller yeah uh, and then it'll top and then you know if they go too far the issue is they could put us into a recession is the concern if that happens then they're going to have to go the, the opposite way and start bringing rates down 
So I've got a lot of clients that are in variable. I've got one that was on the phone with the other day. They've got a $1.3 million variable mortgage. And when we did the deal about eight months ago, they had the opportunity to go with fixed rates. And they said, no, 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 no. Uh, but their payments have gone up and they're a little concerned. Uh, but they've kind of missed the boat because if they want to lock in now, you're looking at 5.2% anyway to lock in. So, um, you know, hopefully they're near the top. And hopefully inflation is a little more in check. We'll see when when the uh, inflation numbers come out for August, and then we'll kind of go from there. So are you recommending people right now to stay uh, variable if they're already locked into variable? If you're in variable, it, it almost makes sense because it depends on the discount you have. Uh, discounts were much higher back then. So prime minus 80, prime minus 90. So if you're, if you're prime minus 80, you know, you're in the mid fours. Uh, for interest rates. But if you're locking in today, you could be locking it at low fives. So you really, you know, best bet is to, to call me or call your bank and find out if you're going to lock in, what would my rate be? And then they've got a decision point to make. Yeah. Um, but rates can't stay high for too long either, because it's just going to slow everything down in the economy. Yeah. Um, when it comes to first time home buyers, um, are you hearing that this is going to, um, obviously it's going to, it's going to slow things down, but there's a lot of products that are for sale out in the market right now. Are you seeing any slowdown as far as the number of transactions that are coming, I guess, on your desk right now? Yeah, for sure. I mean, the, the biggest thing that's kind of killing deals right now is the stress test. And because it's it's the contract rate plus 2%. So even if you got variable prime minus 30, you're still qualifying them in the low sevens. And that's the same thing with uh, fixed rates. I mean, we're qualifying people in the low 7%. So it's, it's challenging for sure. And uh, there's been some talk that they might review or reassess the stress test again, but you know, as a, anything governmental, it takes time to have these things happen. They, they may talk about it, but by the time they implement it is quite, a, quite some time. But that's really, that's the struggle now that people are having. So, you know, when you're, when you're looking at your borrowing power, four to four and a half times your income is kind of what you qualify for. And that's really the case these days. When rates were lower, we could sometimes get up to six times someone's income is what they qualify for. So the stress test is really tightening people's budgets and bringing stuff back. And that's, that's what's hindering most deals on my desk right now. Yeah. Cool. Any questions for Rod guys? Cool. Thanks Rod. Yeah. And if you want to call me directly, just give me a call. From really sad news to exciting party time out in Newfoundland. Um, as I mentioned from the 18th to 21st, this is where a big chunk of people are going to be just heads up. I think there's merit to start a discussion. There's going to be a lot of performers uh, and people going to the Canada conference uh, who's taking care of their business. Uh, for those of you who have relationships with some people that are going, just maybe coordinate a little bit. Um, you know, you're going to go away for three or four days. Who's taking care of your business? Who's your backup? Uh, and I'm sure many of you are having those one-to-one -one conversations, but I throw that out there. A lot of the new agents or agents who have been in the, who are not going, let's say, um, this, this could be an opportunity just to, again, um, work with a, an active agent. Um, but anyways, I, I, this is a great, this is going to be a great event. Uh, we're really excited about it. I'm pretty sure it's, as I said, the, the days are going to be full jam-packed with, with various sessions. Uh, and then the night times are going to be an absolute uh, amazing fun time. Uh, so anyways, looking forward to that. The, um, as I mentioned, the October 4th, let me just put this. Put that way down there. Sorry. Um, so we're going to be getting together again, October 4th. Uh, we'll figure out the, the amount of people that are going to come. I'm pretty sure we can get everybody in the room. Um, but this is going to be a, a, a good, there's a lot to talk about. We've done a lot of changes, 
uh, over the last three or four months. We got, we're going to have a new manager in Orangeville. We've got some um, studio lounges that we've just implemented here in the uh, Brampton office, and we're talking about Orangeville as well. Uh, what else? Uh, just, we're also going to be having Chris Leader come and speak at this uh, at this event as well, too. For those of you who don't know who Chris Leader is, he's a, a coach trainer in the real estate business. And it's funny, I get a lot of feedback and, and I, too, I, I kind of when you hear the same coach or speakers over and over again, it, it can get a little bit tiring or, or, yeah, I've heard that already. You become a little bit disengaged with the message. Uh, it's been over three years. Chris has come out to our facilities and, and chatted, um, and I still very much do believe, as, as many of you, the fundamentals that he coaches on um, are 100% uh, applicable today as they were uh, 10, 15, 20 years ago in the business of real estate. So he's going to come out and chat with us and uh, a, a bunch of other things we're going to be revealing um, at this event as well. So just book that in your calendars. Make sure you guys are coming out to that on October 4th. Cassandra Walker uh, will be reviewing kind of FinTrack policies, making sure that we are compliant um, with our policies. I, I, I've done several videos, but it's funny. I, I chat with Ann Donaldson downstairs and it's, it's amazing how, how incomplete some of those forms are in FinTrack. So we definitely need this, uh, this update reminder. Um, and she's, she's a great person to, to chat. Um, or, or listen to. So that's Wednesday, November 16th. We'll start around 1030. I anticipate it'll be a two hour session. So book yourselves off for that. We'll be seeing uh -huh. that. Yeah, Shazad. FinTrack is mandatory. You need an update every couple of years. So um, you should book it. Otherwise you'll be listening to this uh, video and signing off um, saying that you've, uh, you've been, um, you've done the course and you're compliant. So, you know, in order to avoid all the um, issues with, with FinTrack and, and potential very, very large fines, we have to make sure we provide you with uh, the ability to take these courses, which we're doing on November uh, 16th. We are going to record the session, so you'll be able to listen to it after, but uh, we'll be sending out documentation for you to sign off that you've been, either you attended in person, which is probably the easiest um, via Zoom, or uh, have listened to it afterwards and signed off on it, okay? Great. Yeah. Um, where is it? Sorry, what was that? Uh, where is it? We're, we're gonna do it over Zoom, Grace. So you'll just, you, you, can, you can do it from your house and you just kind of sign in like we're doing right now. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Um, and, I just want to announce, of course, uh, Grace and Greg. I just uh, I, sh I should have welcomed you when we started the car, but or started the the session. Um, but welcome to the Century Twenty One Millennium uh, Brokerage, Grace and and Greg. And um, we're so happy that you joined our our Orangeville office. And uh, what a great addition to the to the team up there. I know um, you've been in the business uh, quite some time. Your your mother had her own started her own brokerage um, up. And let me just try and capture the year was it i think it was early 80s she started the brokerage is that is that right grace 19 1980 1980 yeah so you your your mom's had that very successful brokerage uh with, with you and greg they're working alongside with her um for for many years so um uh, we're just really grateful that you you've joined the brokerage and you're you're great addition i know everybody in the orangeville office is singing your praises um, how delightful uh, you, you both are to have around. So uh, welcome. Well, thank you so much. We're, we're really uh, excited and we're really grateful to the amazing administrative staff there and uh, the ownership. They've been very, you've all been really, really welcoming and available and uh, over the top. So thank you so much. Yeah, very welcome. Welcome to you both. Um, one thing that uh, just on the when we're chatting about the thin track forms there, I would I would say as the market is changing, <clears throat> I, I think our greatest exposure as real estate agents right now is really incomplete paperwork. Um, I don't know, Shazad, if you would uh, agree with that, but one of some of the some of the challenges or pushbacks or uh, deals falling apart 
if, if the paperwork is incomplete, regardless whether you're found to be a part of the blame of that or not, that will, incomplete paperwork will be exposed. Um, and if, if, a, if a transaction say is not going, um, not going to close, uh, again, our job as real estate agents is to protect our clients. And we do that through proper contracts uh, and completing those. If there's ever a, a problem there and, and, it, and it's been exposed, you know, just out of, I guess, frustration, a client might report you through to RICO. And again, I don't do these things to, to scare anybody, but please make sure we're really struggling when we try to help you um, and we see incomplete paperwork or things not done properly. Um, boy, it really hurts uh, your case and your um, in your involvement with directing that client. So just just as a as a as a point there, we're going to be reviewing FinTrack, but also make sure you guys are are being diligent with your paperwork. Okay. Also, in keeping all your uh, your trails, right? So if you have whether you have multiple offers, whether it's um, uh, emails, text messages, do not erase them. Um, you need all your trails. Um, you got to be careful. The time that an offer expires is of the essence. A lot of times, uh, especially in Brampton, you'll notice uh, they'll say, oh, no, no, it's okay. You know, we'll just uh, accept it. And then you can just have your client initial on the irrevocable. Uh, a very da dangerous practice. Uh, you want to follow the rules and the times and make sure if, if the time has passed, they have to sign it back to you to accept. You know, just just be uh, very meticulous in your paper. As we go forward, it's going to get um, it's going to get worse and worse. I've got a case right now personally that um, they dug into the paperwork. The buyers dug into the paperwork, try to see if they had a way to wiggle out of the deal um, because the prices have gone out, have gone down so much, and um, they want out. So they're trying to figure out how do we wiggle out of this deal. So. But our paperwork was uh, was tight, and uh, they have no way out. We still uh, the deal still fell apart. Uh, we're trying; it's on life support right now. Um, it, it'll probably end up going to litigation, um, but at least we've done our part. So there's no, you know, even though the client, as soon as something goes wrong, you're at fault. Doesn't matter how well and how good of a job and how strong relationship you have um she tried to say well you know we could have done this we could have accepted a bigger a bigger deposit we could have done, you know all of those things start to come up and at least we had all of those uh messages on point say well we we told you that the deposit was low and you still wanted to take this offer because it was higher than the last and the, than the other one and so on and so forth right so anyway just be just be careful, take your time, be patient, and make sure all your I's are dotted and your T's are crossed. And, and actually, just further to that, um, I don't think Aaron is on the call here, but he had his uh, personal house. He sold it back in February. The deal did not close. He's going through litigation, but obviously the price of the house was sold much higher uh, and then what he listed for. In that case, the lit litigation lawyer, obviously everything is being tracked um, and actually he's put that under the brokerage um, uh, to, to sell it. It's under actually my name right now, but going through that step by step by step, um, making sure that we're, we're doing everything by the book um, because when deals fall apart, everybody's looking for those loopholes. How can we, how can we get out of that? And the incompetence of a salesperson, although uh, at times, you know, we all make mistakes, but it is, it, we are held to a higher uh, standard and we will be the target uh, if there are um, any damages uh, uh, on either party. And there's going to be damages. People are losing money, both buyers and sellers. So um, keep that in mind, of course. Thanks, Shazad. Um, just a quick note on this. I mentioned at the beginning of the call, we have been doing uh, quite a bit of interviewing. What is really exciting <clears throat> as we've, we've had people reach out to, to apply for this management role, what I'm really pleased about, and I was mentioned this a couple weeks ago, um, just the positive brand, not just like the Century 21 Millennium brand, 
the brand of the agents in the office uh, up there is, is really well respected in the community in Orangeville. Um, and look, we haven't been in Orangeville really that long, six, seven years now, uh, being in the news in the new space for, I guess it's been a year, almost a year. Um, but we, we have a really strong reputation in, in the city of, of Orangeville. And it was, it was just, I keep getting compliments um, from various people at different brokerages. I have interviewed people at all the big brands uh, and there is not just flattery, it is, it is uh, some really sincere um, respect for our agents in that office. So I, I just, again, I wanna give a kudos to uh, Margaret, our current manager there and to Linda um, as well, kind of starting things off there. Um, and, and that's when we saw our biggest growth with it when we first opened the door. So good job, Linda, good job, Margaret. Um, and the new manager, the expectation is to continue that sort of brand um, under that under their leadership. So um, I just wanna say that, again, we're gonna be announcing that next Wednesday. And I think everybody's gonna be really pleased uh, with the decision that we've uh, come to. So I'll leave that for next week. Um, I, 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 many times we, we look at, uh, in typically in the new year, uh, January, people start kind of reassessing, you know, what they're doing in their lives, their goals, their direction, uh, that they're coming to. I'm actually finding a lot of people are doing that naturally right now in September. Uh, Shazad, you, you talked about this, um, these five kind of rings, categories of, of goal setting. Years ago, I remember you saying, ah, I'm trying to find that chart. Where is that? Where is that? And I and I came across actually uh, Joko from head office posted this. I was like, oh, that's the one that I was looking for. But this is actually um, a great time to to assess what, what you're doing this for, the direction you want to take your business, your life. Uh, there are so many people within this brokerage uh, at different stages of their life. <clears throat> one of the things we are starting to see now as uh, new agents get into the business, they're, they're faced with brand new challenges that they've never seen before. In a declining market, look, we've done 42% um, less this year transactions than, than this time last year. So we're going to see less transactions, less, I would assume, of the big, big numbers that we saw in 2022 as far as, far as production goes. But we're also seeing on the tail end where people are kind of transitioning out of the business, we're starting to see um, uh, yeah, changes there and people getting out of the business. Um, assessing where you're going this year over the next six to 12 months is, is a very important um, process to do. And I, I put this list up here. I would encourage you guys, or this, the five categories of, of goal setting here, I'd encourage you to print this off and just start making those notes. As, as you're going into the fall market, if we can squeeze out, you know, I use this as a number, like another three or four deals before the year's end ended, that could make a huge impact to your, uh, I guess, your goal that you set at the beginning of the year. Um, but starting to prep for even 2023, uh, it's not a bad idea. So I just, again, I, I've got a couple of examples here of things that would go in, in various categories, um, you know, spiritual, family, business, financial, personal, so many times. We just look at the dollars that we bring in from our income, from our business, and we're forgetting about all the other areas in our life. And one thing I think you would all agree, trying to find balance over the last two or three years has been extremely difficult in this business. And I would say, and I don't know, Shazad, if you would agree with this, although we, we answer questions about real estate as managers, as leaders in the company, but I think most of the time we're just here to be a sounding board of, of your sanity and, uh, and, and just support, frankly, uh, I, 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 that's been probably my biggest role, just listening to, to people, there's challenges, and whether you're brand new in the business and you're not doing that many deals, or you're a top, top performer, everybody is going through something. So um, I just think this is a great way to kind of get a landscape of where you want to be in your life. So, and, and I just put these down as examples. I don't need to lose 30 pounds, just to be clear. Although, you know, sometimes, I don't know, we'll see. But uh, these are just examples, right? So whatever your goals are, this is a great, great time to do that. Uh, is anybody having a, a tough time selling uh, real estate? Do we have any stale listings out there? 
take out, uh, jump out of this uh, slide presentation there. Um, one of the, the common things that I'm continuing to discuss with agents who have listings is really just, I can't sell this property. I'm, I'm really struggling. What, what are my ideas? Uh, I'd love to open it up. If you got any tips for, for agents that have worked, say, in the last uh, few weeks, um, we'd love to kind of share that and hear from, from you. I, I see Brad there. Uh, <clears throat> good morning, Brad. How are you? Good. Hey, Brad, I know that you have, because you and I have spoken about a couple of listings that you've had, but you're, you're, you're making those deals happen. So have you noticed anything in the last three or four weeks? If you got a stale listing, something that maybe a, a tip that might work for agents here that are struggling? Um, yeah, certainly. Um, so to start, I, it's definitely been a roller coaster. We've had, um, quite a few listings, uh, through the kind of, uh, interest rate hikes. Um, uh, some of the best conversations, uh, they need to be happening frequently with your clients. Uh, you need to be educating your clients constantly and you need to be checking your own mindset um so uh for starters we all know that the interest rates are uh, driving prices down and um we need to make sure that our clients recognize that we are not um uh we do not set market value we interpret it and we have to continue to uh, adjust according to the market dynamics so regardless of what has sold in the past or what's currently uh, available everything needs to come back to the buyer so what is the buyer's options what's the buyer's best option and wh what what type of value does that represent and so um, you have to continue to coach your client through this process make sure and this is one of my favorite lines for clients who especially if they already own real estate and they're just upset because they've seen market values drop by 30 percent um and they feel like they're missing out and they're being cheated from getting a, uh, the sale price that they feel they deserve um i just always come back to the point that it's like look guys you have no idea how good you have it i don't give a crap that the market values have dropped 30 percent. i want you to really stop and think about what real estate typically does Real estate typically increases by what, four or 5% a year. So you're complaining to me, uh, having been in one of the best generations in the last hundred years for market value growth. And you're complaining to me about market values dropping 30%. But since you've owned this property, it's quadrupled in value. If you look at it from that perspective, you should be coming from this position with gratitude rather than fear and, and, and anger because that fear and anger only builds up and eats away at you. And I can tell you that this conversation I've had so many times, and I've had it with one client who sold with me in February for 1.76 million and just sold with me again because of the deal fell apart for 1293. So think about that. She lost half a million dollars and I'm still able to make sure that she's smiling and grateful for how well she's done in real estate. So if you can build yourself and, and if you can build your clients up and make them understand that they're winning, oftentimes it's that emotional bit that's the most important. Even like the money is, is important, sure. But oftentimes people are super greedy right now and it's not actually money that they need. So it's the difference of having, yes, a, a, a chunk of change in your bank account. Um, uh, but oftentimes these same people may even not have a mortgage after the fact. Uh, if they do have a mortgage, obviously, you know, I, I always put it into this perspective. Look, I have personal experience. My own mom has, has, does not have uh, equity. She does not have a pension. She does not have any financial security. She doesn't have a husband. She doesn't have uh, any type of security uh, from that perspective either. So when you're talking to me and saying that, Brad, I can't believe it. We, you know, we were expecting this much money extra for my retirement. I say, look, if you were to look at your life and compare it to my mom's position or other people that I know in my personal life or my work life or as clients. I'm telling you right now, you are so much further ahead and you have so much to be grateful for. So please think about that when you're depressed at night, thinking about market values declining. And let's talk about your life goals. Is your life goal to stay in this house or is your life goal to move on, to, to, to move closer to your kids? Is your life goal to um, you know get to that next job? Like realistically, is this asset 
providing value to your life. If the answer is no, and you need to sell, then it's not a matter of, um, are we going to be able to sell? It's a matter of what decisions do we need to make so that we can get a sold sign on your lawn and recognizing that I'm not the bad guy. I'm here to help you interpret and digest this information in a way that's going to let you have a positive mental health coming out of this situation. And a lot of that is just shifting perspective for clients, letting them know you're on their side and that you're trying to help them and you're not pushing them, but you're giving them the guidance they need to make the right decisions to make this process as short as possible. Um, you can tell Brad has listings in a challenging market because he's, he's, he's right in that zone there. Um, and, and actually, Brad, just to kind of echo exactly what you're saying, you're just saying you've got to set the right expectations and you've got to give perspective uh, to the bigger picture here. And so I would absolutely agree. Those are, those are the fundamentals. Of, of working with, with clients that are, are really frustrated. Brad, on the point of like, okay, when we get down to the marketing of it, take the clients aside, I got a stale listing that's been on the market for 30 plus days. What are some of the tips that you do to kind of get action, getting buyers to come through that property right now? So, um, look, it's not rocket science. If the house is overpriced uh, or you're getting no showings over a, a, a decent period of time, it's overpriced. Trying to find this magic bullet that's going to create buyers who are going to pay higher than what a comparable property that's available is going to go for um, is, a, is, a, is a losing battle. Um, I, I think that if you go about it systematically, then you don't have to question this each time. So what I talk to when I, and, and I understand what you're getting at Trevor, like what, what types of tips and tricks can you do? Yeah. Okay. So some of the gimmicks that you can turn around and tell your clients that you're doing to try to improve their marketability would be, you know, uh, we have a listing in Caledon. So we're doing uh, uh, an event uh, at the uh, Caledon uh, or the Brampton Flying Club. And uh, so for one of our $3 million listings, uh, we're going there and we're going to be uh, hawking marketing content to wealthy pilot owners uh, about our listing that's nearby. Um, you know, and then I tell my client that we're doing that. We've done fancy open houses for our clients um, where we've invited our the client base from our database that reflect that market value or people that we think could up grade into that price bracket um, so that we can try to do like that matchmaking setup. It's very time consuming, uh, costly, and um, you know the rate of return is not even close to that of doing regular and strategic price reductions. Um, and and uh, one of the key things, um, you know, obviously any sale is so highly correlated with your relationship with the seller that to separate the seller from that from how you sell a real estate is, is very difficult to do um, because uh, making sure that they're in the right mindset, I think is probably, you know, the majority of our job short of doing our proper job of getting the house prepared properly and getting the right marketing material out the onset. The last thing you, and I tell this to every single seller that I, that I, that I, we interview is, um, look, the last thing you want from your agent is to be listed and asking them what more could they be doing? Because if you are in that position, it means you already started with not the perfect first impression. So if, and it doesn't mean that you have to be perfect. It just means that, look, seller, let's do the absolute most that you're willing to do to get your house prepared and showing properly to the, to the MLS. Let's do this all before we have it on the MLS. And after the MLS, you don't have to have the anxiety of saying, shit, I should have done this. If you aren't going to do it before we get it on the market, then let's not worry about that because we can't second guess these things. You get one chance at a good first impression. And you know if they still find that there's things that they should have done that they forgot about, it's not your fault because you made sure that they understood you only get one chance at a good first impression. Um, yeah. Outside of that, 
it's always about price reductions. And every week I have a full slate of uh, like a full new market analysis snapshot. So we go over all of the showings they've had, the feedback, we go over uh, the, the reach that's been online and, and they can see with our advertisements that they're getting considerable amount of reach. The eyeballs are seeing their ads so they can't dispute the marketing side of things. And then we can get down to the nuts and bolts of it. So, hey, look, we've been 10 days without a showing that means we need a price reduction or, hey, we've had 10 showings and no offers. That means we need a price reduction. Um, and, and these are all aspects that as agents we recognize, but we become biased for our client's benefit. And uh, although it feels good to advocate for our clients in our own head about why their price is uh, adequate and why their house is unique and has extra value. The reality is, is we don't make that decision. The buyers do. And if the buyers aren't coming to see the house and the buyers aren't giving you offers, then clearly something's wrong. And, and it's your responsibility as the professional to find the solution. And the solution often is how do we make this house more appealing? And that's a price reduction. So, yeah. so long as you approach it systematically, then um, you don't have to feel like you're making mistakes. It's, it's like going down uh, stairs, right? And in this market with interest rates co constantly climbing, um, you, you cannot afford to be slow because if you make a price reduction, but 30 days later than it should have been done, then that price reduction is inadequate anyways, or you need to make a dramatic price reduction. Look, I've done price reductions of $400,000 in, 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 a, in an instance of a property uh, up north. I've done uh, you know a $200,000 price reduction um, in a property in Brampton that was sitting at 1.4. We went down to 1.2 and then I sold it for 1.293. So yeah. had I just gone down to 1.3, I probably wouldn't have got any offers, but at 1.2 yeah. I did. And so, so sorry, I don't mean to cut you off there, Brad, but like we, we, it, I'm hearing that the common theme is like price, 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 make sure it's priced right. And if it's and it's not selling, it's been there for a couple of weeks, and you're not getting the showings. You know, you gotta you gotta come back to that price, of course. I, I just threw up these not threw up. I, I just posted these um, di different tips here. Um, one thing that I know really works, and and uh, Louis Camara has done this to me. Trevor, can you go take a look at my listing over here, and then give me feedback and make sure you type it out, da, 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 so I can help with that client and trying to get that price reduction there. Um, that's always helpful. Um, whether it be your manager in the office or other agents in the office, lending a hand, I, I think there's there's a lot of benefits uh, to go around there. But I, Brad, I love your I love your feedback. One of the comments I just saw in in the in the chat there from Margaret, she was talking about <clears throat> making sure that that property does appraise. Um, <clears throat> as far as that's kind of like a, a I guess an expectation is what she was probably getting at there. With the seller look even if we get a sale price uh, like a house that sold back in february it's got to appraise um rod you and i were chatting last week about appraisals the bank or the lender has the right to do a, an appraisal at any point in time and and it's interesting we, we talked about months ago we were talking about trying to get the appraisals done as soon as possible but even with some lenders it they can up until the very last day decide, and these are extreme scenarios. I know. Yeah. They they can decide. You know what? No, 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 no. The way things are going, we're gonna we're gonna pull pull that there as well too. So is is that something that? But is that something you and I were chatting about? Are you starting to see that more more often? Still haven't seen it. Knock on wood. Uh, but as as we discussed earlier, you really want to get the appraisal done sooner or later because then they're using comps from further back because they can go three to six months uh, sometimes. Uh, but some lenders are still using the auto appraisal. So uh, I'm full appraisals. Luckily, I haven't had to do them. As long as they're landing in that price range, we've been okay. But I have heard of instances where houses aren't appraising. So you got to make sure you've got a backup plan. It's either a bigger down payment or the ability to borrow, not borrow, but get gifted funds from family. Yeah. Good. I mean, again, again, to the point of tips to sell your house, houses don't sell for three reasons. Typically, obviously the price, um, the location that the proximity is there. I don't know. Is there a, a depot behind the house? Is there something wrong with that location? And then the condition of the home as well, too. Be careful with the staging right now. I, I love staging and for the right property, I do uh, list that. And, but with the right client, I'm, I'm staging as well, too. 
and I'm definitely seeing more pushbacks of um, if that property doesn't sell or the, the, the seller's not willing to reduce their price and you've got $1,500, $2,000 a month in staging that you've got to pay for, oof, that's really going to hurt you. So I just uh, make a note there. <clears throat> Market staff, we put these up uh, right before the long weekend there. I mean, we, we kind of see where things are going. We expected August to be... Um, Kind of, kind of low there, but we are seeing uh, still continuing to, to dropping prices for detached homes in the Sasaga. Um, 0.7, that's kind of flat for semis. Uh, we saw it go up in um, the city of Mississauga for townhomes and, and still a little bit of a drop for uh, condos. In Caledon, big drops. I, these are major drops. Uh, Caledon, though, is a smaller pool of, of um, data points, uh, typically, but the detached homes, which is the majority of them, that's still going down. That's a significant number. Um, and then, of course, in Brampton, it's a 2% drop. We had that in, in March, or sorry, July as well, 2% drop, about $35,000, $40,000 um, is what it is. It has... It's, I don't want to say it's starting to, to mellow out uh, or flatten out. It hasn't. It's still dropping, but it's not as significant as it was from the spring into the later parts of the spring there, uh, April, May. So, I, I mean, these are pre-pandemic prices, aren't they? I mean, this is what houses were selling for right before uh, the pandemic. So, I don't know. Have we really lost, to, to Brad's point, perspective in the last two, three years? It's, it's been getting a little out of hand, but... Um, needless to say, our business as real estate agents, it's about the transactions. Now, you know, the prices sell. Yes, we're going to make 20 or 30 percent less money potentially on the commissions, but it's it's all about the deals that we're, we're, we're putting out there. So and then in the city of Orangeville, of course, 44 homes, two months of inventory. I guess technically that's still a seller's market. Does it feel like a seller's market up there? Linda, does it feel like a seller's market up there? Or does it feel like a buyer's market? Oh, 100% buyer's market. Yeah, I know. And it's, it's, it's confusing oh, yeah, when you see sure. months of inventory and two months of inventory. Well, that's still a seller's market. That doesn't feel like it. That doesn't feel like it. No. <laughs> um, I do see that's a significant- No, the, most, the biggest conversations we're having with our sellers is again, about price reduction. That's all it is, it seems. Yeah. Buyers have caught up with the new market. Sellers have not. Yeah. Sadly. Um, one thing I, I wanted to bring up is uh, I think everybody's seen the deposit instructions. This is really what I wanted to, to bring up. Shazad, um, I know last week you updated, uh, you were working with uh, Martin Gwynn on, on the Schedule B there, updating that. Um, there's a couple just on the, the interest rates, I think that was changed uh, there a little bit, but the deposit instructions, both these forms, Schedule B, when you do a listing, that's going to be put up there as an attachment or a schedule. And then deposit instructions for any listing going forward, we're actually going to put this on there because that's just like a common question people are getting. How do I deposit uh, this, these funds here? Well, there's three ways you, four ways you can do that um, with Century 21 Millennium, and, and all the details are there. So the, your your the buyers, the cooperating agent, just just needs to kind of pass that over to their to the buyer. So, Trevor. It, yeah. Sorry, where where are these two forms going to be? Because you said well, you're going to put these up there, but like we upload our own listings. So yeah. where are the yeah. forms? Where are the forms now? So we so schedule the the deposit instructions. We're going to be uploading those on the under the documents in web forms as a as a form you can grab there as well too. Schedule B. Christina, are we uploading that as a document in the templates? Yeah, so typically standard practice, even if the front desk uploads a listing or if the agents upload on their own, uh, those listings are accessed by the admin to ensure that the Schedule B and 801 are on the listings. Yeah. And at this point, it's really going to be the addition of the third form, which is the trust deposit information. 
But so for rock listing. stars, for rock stars like Tony who upload her own um, listings, where will she, where will she find that uh, these two documents so she can upload that? As of right now, they're not going to be shared to any Google Drive. Um, we can email it to you, or I think Trevor, it's, it's a little bit more secure right now to have them on a template for a listing form in web forms. I, I think it's safe. I think it is safe for us to put that in our documents under web forms under the templates, especially if you're doing the listing um, yourself. As um, I'll, I'll circle back with Denise about sending out an email. I know she was a little bit like, oh, I don't want certain things getting out there, but it's like, well, it's out there. Someone wants to do something with it, they can do something with it. Well, yeah, and if it's gonna be attached to a listing, they're gonna see it anyways. Well, but, real, real yeah, it, agents will yeah. see it. In yeah. terms of if it circulates via email, you just don't know if anything can happen. Like. Through MLS, it's a login, it's secured, it's only member ID access, nothing's forward facing to, to the public. No, no, I, I understand that, but I'm just saying yeah. like, if we go to upload the listings, I have to be able to attach the Schedule B like I do now mm -hmm. um, to my draft, right? And if we're gonna attach the deposit instructions as well to the listing, as, as agents, I'm just asking where we can get those forms from. So yeah, if you can let us know where at some point. Yeah. I think for sure, Tony, I think for sure on the templates, that's gonna be there. I don't see a problem with emailing this stuff out. This is just to our Millennium agents anyway. So we'll, we'll leave it at that for now. We'll, we will likely just email it out to you and we'll have this out by the end of the day or an answer on this for you by the end of the day. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, of course, oh, cool. Um, so, question just for clarif yep. clarification, um, is it appropriate then to put the deposit instructions as an attachment with your listing or is that just something we provide once the house is sold? I think it's appropriate to put it up ahead of time, um, for any agent who's going to be, um, putting an offer in whether it be the Schedule B or the instructions on the deposit, what, what we are seeing right now, I don't know if anybody can agree, uh, when you're a cooperating agent, I'm actually starting to see the, <clears throat> the deposit instructions on the Schedule B, actually. Um, but there's so much data, there was so much information for us, we're like, we can't do it. There's, there's different ways people may want to submit that. So we'll do that as a separate file. So to answer your question, Grace, um, yeah, you, you can, you can upload the schedule B and you can upload the deposit instructions as a, as an attachment, um, to your listing. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Most offices are doing that now. Anyways, up in Orangeville, they, they have a separate attachment for deposit instructions. Yeah. Uh, like separate? Uh, like attached to the MLS as an attachment, they have a separate attachment to the listing. Got it. Okay, so we're in line. We're in line there. Yeah. Cool. Um, how to trigger an escape clause. This has come up multiple times uh, in both our Branton office and our Orangeville office. And it, you know, you didn't sell. You, if you've just been selling the last four or five years, you probably never even knew this was a thing. Um, so this is something I just want to kind of lay the scenario out. Um, I, I just copy pasted this. This is a, a clause <clears throat> that the I, when representing a buyer, hey, they still have to sell their house. They want to buy your house, uh, but they still have to sell their house. So there's a condition you can do, which is a, a condition on the sale of the buyer's home. Um, within a period of time, whether it be uh, a month that they get to do that. Um, and then what's triggered typically with a condition on the sale of their home is a escape clause whereby the buyer is giving notice if another offer comes in within that say 30 day period, another offer comes in, ooh, this one's good. We're gonna, we're gonna, we wanna actually take this offer. Well, with a condition on the sale of the buyer's home, typically an escape clause is, is connected with that for the seller's uh, choice to, to bring in that other 
um, that other offer. And, and we typically see like a 48 hour or 72 hour um, escape clause. So I can, I give notice now to the, as, a, as the seller, I give notice to the uh, original buyer, hey, you've got 72 hours to either firm up um, on your offer. Cause yes, you had that condition for 30 days, but I put an escape clause, my agent put an escape clause in there so that I can entertain other offers. So they have 72 hours either to walk away from the deal or to, um, to firm up. Well, the, the, the point that I wanted to bring up here <clears throat> was, I think, is there a form for that? Do I do that as an amendment? Do I just send an email? There's an actual form. And, and some of you who have been selling for a long time, you're like, hey, time, Trevor, it's the condition to remove uh, those conditions there. So this is the form. It's called Notice to Remove the Conditions uh, for the Agreement Purchase and Sale, and it's Form 121. Uh, obviously, just I just wanted to bring this to light as to the scenario, and then again the the form that you're using to notify that original buyer. Yes, you may have had your condition on the sale of your home, but we had that 72 hour uh, escape clause, and I'm now activating it because I've received a really good offer that I would like to take if, if you don't want to firm it up. And so this is the form you're plugging in the details. Obviously, buyer or seller the address that you've got there. And um, I'll just read it out loud in accordance with the terms and conditions of the agreement of purchase and sale. We hereby advise you um, we have received another offer to the purchase of the above mentioned property, which is acceptable to us. Um, this, um, this is to advise you that you have now, and then you would obviously put the date in there that represents the 72 hours <clears throat> and uh, to remove the condition pertaining to, and these are the referencing uh, conditions there. And it's, it's a notification, so the seller would sign off on that uh, at the bottom there, and the buyer would uh, then acknowledge that as well, too. So I, I just thought that came up a couple times, and I see Grace has got her hand up there. Grace, do you have a comment or a question? <laughs> oh, this, this new girl with all the questions. I love it. <laughs> um, yeah, I've, I've, like, I've used this forum many times. Um, and but I have a new question now, and that is, um, is it okay to give the notice? Like when people are selling their listings now, they're saying um, they're not going to report it until they get the deposit. So how does that how does that stand with giving the notice? If we're giving notice, should we have the deposit before we give the notice? I, I we haven't in the past. Tony seems to know we the haven't, answer to we that. We haven't in the past. We have not in the past, but it's just a question because there's so many experiences where people are not getting the deposit. And now they're sitting there with a deal with no deposit and you've given notice to someone to to uh, just something to think about or uh, yeah, notice given mean, upon so, receipt of deposit. So the deposit is supposed to be technically received within 24 hours. So you're saying, hey, we got a sale. We got the agreement purchase and sell. It could be, what are you saying? Like three days later, we still don't have the deposit. And then we say, um, um, receive a, we've accepted the offer that has a conditional on the sale of the buyer's property. Another offer comes in. Well, am I using, is, are, is your question, do I use this when I haven't even received the deposit? No, yeah. when you, When you go to put the first person on notice because you've got an accepted second offer, would you wait to put that first person on notice until you had the deposit from the second offer? That's what no. we used to always do. No, can I try? We used to all, we, because what happens if you put the first person on notice and the second person doesn't give you the deposit when it becomes null and void? Got it. First Margaret's going to answer it. Margaret, thank you. Well, yeah, no, I just thought for sure, like, you know, obviously when the, the second offer is contacting you to tell you that, you know, we are going to bring in an offer in an attempt to bump the first offer, I would just be having the conversation with that agent at that time saying, make sure then that you bring your certified deposit, you know, with the offer or as soon as it's done, because your 48 hours is going to start once we know we have a deposit. Because I agree, like what happens if you send the notice out right away and buyer number two says, I'm, I'm backing out and number one backs out too. So I would try to have that conversation with the second agent saying, you know, 
because they want that time to start clicking as soon as possible, right? So that the people don't have as much time. So just, you know, say that's you've got yeah, to bring it to profit. Yeah, that's good. I, or you, you, the, you have the second offer, the deposit here with, you just make that standard for that second offer that I think may so. bump a first offer. It's just something to really think about. We never ran into this years ago. I put many people on notice and never had a problem. That's a great we're point. We're seeing a problem. People not delivering deposit checks. Um, and I think it's something we have to address. Well, you're, you're that. Saying, it's just my, just a, yeah, go ahead, Tony. Sorry. Um, everything I've been reading up on this kind of stuff a lot, and especially in these last markets. And I know the common sense thing or the legal thing. And again, I'm not a lawyer, um, but when that second offer is accepted, whether or not they bring in the deposit is irrelevant because they don't bring the deposit in, they're in breach of contract, no matter what, right? So that's that's the legal side of it. You know what I'm saying? Like, so you gave, you accepted your second offer, you gave your first guy's notice um, with or without the deposit check. I'm just saying within that 24 hours of receiving the check, if that second offer doesn't bring in their deposit, that second offer is in breach, whether or not you have a deposit anyways. It just gets really it messy. It doesn't point. come in, they're in well, breach. And two things on that, if it's a firm offer, right? Well, well of course, it, think, it would normally sorry, yeah, be a said, firm offer, of course. Exactly. Um, but now you've interrupted a good offer in position. So I'm just I, trying to protect the, the seller. I never had this worry before, but I have this worry today. Everybody. So, has I'm <laughs> yeah. But yeah, Grace, right? I, I, so I, have, we... I was just going to say, sorry, I have a bit of a delay on my end here, but I was, I was going to say Tony's to Tony's point. If, if that second offer is accepted and again, it would probably be a firm offer. You're not going to bump something. that's not a firm offer. Um, once that, that signature is done, irrevocable, everything's done properly, that's contract law kicks in and then that, that person's on the hook. So that's the legal side of it. But okay. But the practical side, if I go through litigation, to, that's a two, three year, $30,000 job to get that money back potentially. So you still, you still are weighing the, the risks and benefits in that scenario. But I wonder, um, when you submit that offer, um, and even if, you, as a preference, if there's going to be an, an offer accepted, it's uh, instead of upon acceptance, it's here with. Uh, and that, that deposit then is presented as an image like, yeah, we've got that. Now I can consider um, potentially doing the right thing or advising my client to do the right thing. I, I think on that. Again, I don't get involved with that stuff uh, normally as well, too. But in, as you're kind of thinking through the risks with it, uh, let's make sure it's rather than upon acceptance. No, nope. herewith is is what we're considering when we when we choose to trigger this this. And, uh, and we've made it really easy now with the the new deposit options. They can actually just send us the money via bill payment. So mm. a, yeah, a, a buyer can actually go on their online banking, pick Century One Millennium as a bill payment, and send the deposit that way. The instructions are on the notes, obviously, but. So there's absolutely no reason why somebody can't give you the deposit. If they have the money in the bank, they should be able to give you the deposit within five minutes and give you the confirmation. The only problem with that, isn't there a limit that how much they can send? Most people there have isn't. a limit. There's mm -hmm. no limit with the bill payment. Okay. Yeah, so they could, they could make that bill payment. And again, in case you run into a, an issue where, oh no, I'm sorry, you can only send you 10,000, yeah. uh, then you, you change the offer to do multiple deposits, right? So um, anything to take some security from the, from the uh, at this point is, uh, uh, and, and I can totally understand Grace's uh, uh, question because it never used to be a major issue. It's become a, uh, you know, a, a, a huge issue, especially in the market that we're dealing with. Uh, we're finding uh, people are walking away saying, sue me kind of uh, approach understanding that only maybe 10 percent of the people are actually suing so because of the cost are enormous cool 
Um, oh my gosh, I can't believe we're already past one o'clock, but um, just a couple more points here. Grace, I hope, did we answer your question, Grace? Yeah, I, I just wanted to bring it up because I'm just thinking about myself <laughs> day to day, like I'm just thinking about the red flags that come along, that's all. Yeah, no, that, that's a really good point to bring up for discussion as well too. So, and and many times in the scenario, depending on the buyer, you know, again, you're, you're, you're weighing out the risks uh, with the benefit of kicking the other great offer that potentially got away. So it's not to right. be taken lightly, of course. Um, so just, I'm gonna move ahead here. I, I got this challenge, which is really into, the bigger question is how are we handling um, buyers that are out there right now, trying to go directly to the listing agent. And this has been around for a long, long time, but I've actually had this come up a few times now um, Trevor, how do we get them into the buyer representation agreement contract? Because I don't want to waste my time driving around all over the place. Um, and and you know I, maybe I can save this for next week. But I just this is this is a, a larger conversation. I want people to be aware of. Uh, I will leave it at the difference between client and customer. You should know that your definitions for that are on form eight ten. And I just kind of copied and pasted it here. Fiduciary interest for the client. Um, uh, great customer service, um, um, professionalism, honesty, integrity with uh, with a with a customer. But fiduciary uh, duty is the is the main difference there. And you have to you don't have to be one or the other. But in, in when it refers to the confirmation of cooperation, again, I'm really talking to the newbie agents here that are on the call here. Um, in your confirmation of cooperation, uh, there's three ways a buyer is being represented by the cooperating brokerage either by, um, uh, as a client, uh, through customer service, or neither. So you can work with someone without having them under either buyer representation agreement or a customer service agreement. Um, there's no representation here. However, the definition is, it's, um, uh, you have to follow that protocol. So if it's a client, it's a buyer representation agreement. That's what defines a client. Um, and then if it's customer, of course, customer service agreement. So each of those uh, buyer representation agreements form 300, buyer customer uh, service agreement is form 310. Um, this is reviewed for many of us, but I, I just wanted, it came up and it was important to put onto our, um, into our notes here. I, I mean, these are just random tips that I kind of put together here, um, tips in different comments. You're, whatever the client wants to do, it's up to them. You can't force them to do one or the other, first off. Um, these are just talking points that you can discuss, whether you can take it to a different level or, or kind of tone it back and leave that up to your um, wordsmithing. Um, but I think there, there is scenarios where many of you are working with several different uh, clients, buyers right now, and you will prioritize their, your time because you only have so much time in a day, right? So um, you know, these are just various things to discuss with the client. Uh, but again, they're not, it's not mandatory that they have to work with you either, either or, okay, as, if, as, as that paperwork is defined. I don't wanna to spend too much time on that because we're, we're past the time here. And actually that's the end of, of the points um, that I wanted to just bring up uh, today. Hopefully that was a good session um, for you guys if you, on the, on the uh, uh, schedule B and on the um, direction, the, the deposit direction. And I'm 9% sure we're going to email that out. There's no zero reason I can think of why that can't be sent out to our agents internally here um, for you to upload your own listings. And it will be, I'm pretty sure it's it's already on the uh, documents for uh, templates for, for listings as well too. Cool. Guys, we went way over, but is there... I mean, this is our first session after a very long, beautiful summer. Is there anything else that um, anyone wanted to discuss uh, today or bring up questions, comments? Trevor? Yes, Tony. Sorry. <laughs> um, I just, just because it's something I ran into. Um, and Trev has actually sent out a notice uh, in regards to advertising POTLs, P-O-T-Ls, Parcel yes. Applied Land Properties, as freeholds. Um, they are now supposed to be listed as condominiums. 
uh, according to Trev, and again, if you go in and read their notices, because what everybody, and including myself at some point a few years ago, was listing a pothole, townhome or whatever it is, or detached, semi, whatever, as freehold, and then in comments, uh, putting, you know, parcel tied land, maintenance fee is whatever. $99 a month, including garbage pickup, snow removal, even though the freehold form, which makes no sense, has a box that you can tick off pottle and put in a pottle fee. But Treb has put out a notice that pottles now are to be listed as condominium. But you can go on and read it on, on Treb. Yeah, you, you actually brought that up to me, thank you, Tony, uh, a couple weeks ago. Um, I, I got to check with the other boards if that's a consistent thing being done across the other boards though. Um, I haven't, I'll check, I'll check with Reb and we'll check with Lakelands up north as well too. Um, so let's, I, I'm going to put a soft pin in that one and discuss it next week and get back to you on that because I don't know what our, uh, our statement's going to be on that just yet if it's not consistent across the board. Okay. Fair, fair Tony. Cool. Anything else? Well, you guys look really well rested. It's like it's like you guys just relaxed all summer. Like nobody worked here. All right. I know that's not true. Actually, uh, quite the opposite. I know you guys have had a like ridiculous last two years, if not summer. Um, everybody's working really hard, especially if you're on this call. Your your mindset is in this. Okay. And um, I just want to say of all the conversations I've been having, um, you know, keep your sanity and keep yourselves uh, healthy. And uh, remember, I I'm really, uh, the five different categories of goal setting there, um, yourself, you have to take care of yourself. And that's something a lot of people are just not paying attention to their own health, their own mental state. And it's not cliche. I'm having this conversation at least a couple times a day um, with people struggling. So um, stay um, stay positive. Don't watch the news. Uh, stay focused on on what's important to you in your life. Understand why you're doing all this, and um, and and we'll stay on the the narrow road to uh, to success. There, um, we'll do Wisdom Wednesday next week, and then the following week we're going to be in uh, Newfoundland. So. I uh, look forward to seeing everybody there, but uh, we'll chat with everybody next week. Thank you, Trevor. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Nice Bye, seeing everybody. Bye, everybody.